Office Hours, April, DBA. My first comment office is, what on earth are you people doing on the line? It's Easter Thursday, you should be off spending time with your loved ones and spending time with, uh, with chocolate or however you choose to celebrate Easter. Hopefully uh, you will still enjoy this hour of Office Hours and still enjoy the hour of tech and, uh, and use it as a way of shotgunning yourself straight into Easter. I obviously like talking tech, that's why I'm here every month and uh, hopefully you will enjoy the hour. Let's jump into it. Let me share that little bunny again. Uh, each month I stick a whole lot of things on terms of how to get to my blog, my YouTube channel, Twitter, social media, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, let's just make it nice and easy. I found this little website called Linktree or linktr.ee and they're a little free service and what you do is they just you provide one link and you click on that and it'll simply give you the screen dump you can see uh, in the bottom left there which is all the possible ways of getting in touch with me uh, so hopefully that makes it nice and easy and hopefully the Connor is nice and easy to remember going forward that's hopefully a nice easy way of remembering how to get in touch with me feel free to reach out via blog via Twitter etc um, always like talking technology and obviously AskTomTheOral.com, which is where we lurk, Chris and I, most of the time. I have to admit, Ask Tom has been a, a little bit reluctant to open up its questions or a little bit uh, as not as open as it has been over the last couple of months because Chris and I have been traveling a whole lot. So it's that balancing act we have of uh, desperately trying to come out and actually speak and meet people as well as doing our job on Ask Tom. As I say every month, do not adjust your set. When you look at the slides, everything appears in the bottom left. Uh, that's because when we re-engineer this into YouTube uh, for later distribution, uh, we put my ugly face up at the top right. And so don't panic if the slides are down at the left. That's just what we do. A couple of bits and pieces before we get into it. I'm going to try to shoot along so we get our stuff done tonight. First one is coming up in July is the thing called the Yatra tour. It's a tour of Indian cities uh, sponsored by the Groundbreaker community inside Oracle uh, plus the All India Oracle Users Group, a conjunction of the two run by Sai uh, Penamaru. You probably know him from Sangam or just all over Twitter and uh, he's just a force of nature when it comes to running user groups. There's the website there. They're actually doing 10 cities this year. So if you're a keen speaker and you want to really, you know, um, stretch your boundaries and, and really test yourself out or and probably better just have a absolute rollicking good time um, I'd encourage you to submit a paper for uh, the Yatra tour um, I intend to be there for some or most of the cities it really depends on how it clashes with my kids school holidays and the like but I'm hoping to get there for a whole chunk of it some new cities this year but please go to that uh, website if you're a speaker and are interested in seeing just some of the amazing parts of India. Second bits and pieces, April, uh, unless you've been living under a rock, you would have seen the cacophony of emails and tweets and web posts and blog posts that it's CPU time in the old language, as in we have a release um, update come out for Oracle 18 and uh, other databases for security patches. So I rolled out from 18.5 to 18.6 on my local database uh, yesterday so hopefully it'll st still run all fine but it seemed to go fine but yeah so obviously check your emails check your blog posts you want to be applying uh, that patch if you're on 18 as soon as possible or the equivalent patch for 12 11 etc because it's got a bundle of security fixes uh, in there and obviously staying up there and security is critical now uh, you'll notice I haven't put anything about 19 in there but I think in terms of general availability of 19, I don't think it's far away. That, that's really all I know. But uh, if you're itching to get your hands on 19, uh, obviously you can just jump onto any of the cloud offerings now. But if not, um, it shouldn't be too far away to download and play with. So here's the questions we received. There's actually six. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to get through them all. And the first one I'm going to talk about actually was the last question to come in. And normally I try to put them in order such that the people that take the time to put a question in in ahead of, that, in ahead of time will get treated first. But this one came in um, just a couple of hours ago and I thought it's very easy to treat. It's just, it'll just be me having a bit of a rant. So we thought we'd cover that one first. But then we'll go into in memory not working, our performance, hints not working, 
Uh, small tables do not require indexes and faster inserts. Uh, just thing I will say is these questions that do come in on the DBA office hours, and I very much appreciate them, uh, be aware that we do have a dedicated in-memory office hours and obviously a dedicated backup and recovery office hours. I'm happy to take any questions. As I said, I love talking tech. Um, just a shout out there, if you want to get the real experts um, on those particular technologies, uh, maybe those dedicated office hours are the way to go. Um, you'll, on our man and like, you will very quickly exhaust my knowledge, um, but we do our best. So the first one's on Max Extents, and here's the question that came in. I'm getting the following error, and as you imagine we've run out of extents. Max Extents 1024 reached in some object, index or table, doesn't really matter. Uh, the key thing is there is notice that it's 1024, so that's definitely not the default or some uh, constant that's designed as part of the Oracle database. So an administrator has explicitly set max extents to 1024 in this particular example. But the question is, what do I do to rectify it? I don't have admin privilege. I requested the admin to automatic extents to unlimited, and he suggested to recreate the index and not touch max extents. So back to how do we rectify max extents? So here's the rant that I will go on now is Max extents became unlimited from 7.3 and then improved upon vastly in 8.1. We've spoken about that in a previous office hours session. However, that is not to say that we're endorsing that all tables should be allowed just to go into millions upon millions upon millions of extents. So I think it's good practice for DBAs to be regularly monitoring extents on tables to make sure they don't climb into ridiculous numbers. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is if you think a table is going to be, say, 1,000, 1 megabyte extents, and then you see it's in a million extents, it's not the number of extents that I'm particularly concerned about. It's the fact that your prediction of that object was to be about a gigabyte in size, 1,000 times 1 meg. If it's now grown to a terabyte in size, that means something about this application, something about this data is dramatically different to your expectations. Maybe that's a great thing. Maybe you've been successful in your, you know, bringing in hundreds of millions of sales. Maybe it's a, a problem though. Maybe it means something's gone wrong, something's spilling data or not cleaning up data, etc. So it's worth ex examining or investigating to see why something has grown into an unexpected number of extents. And the second thing I would say is, as a result, yes, it's good to be monitoring above a certain threshold, and this DBA has chosen 1,024. But monitoring above a certain threshold is very different to actually establishing a hard capped ceiling. Because if you're getting this error, that means your application is down or something is broken in your application. I don't think as DBAs we should ever break an application you know, un unless the, the seriousness of the occasion warrants it. If we're getting hacked, we might shut our applications down. If we you know, have, have found some sort of auditing breach, whatever, we may choose to break, suck, shut applications down. But shutting an application down or breaking an application here simply because it's reached a high number of extents, I think that's doing a terrible service to your customers. In reality, yes, monitor for above some number, 1,024, but don't make that the limit. Still leave your max extents as unlimited, or if you're monitoring for 1,024, maybe make your limit 10,000, something that you're gonna pick up via monitoring before you actually get to the stage where you interrupt customers' usage of your applications. Our job as DBAs is continuity of service. And to actually put these artificial limits on max extents, I think is a very bad idea. So my advice to the person who's um, uh, raised this question is pretty simple. One, I think you should tell your admin they're wrong. Uh, that's in my opinion. Um, I'm happy to talk to them about it. I think it's just a bad practice to interrupt applications and interrupt customers from trying to get their job done. However, it doesn't mean you should be automatically making all your max extents unlimited. I think there's a middle ground there that we can all have. Uh, not touching max extents, I think is bad advice from your admin. But that's enough on that one. Let's move on to the questions that came in a little bit earlier. So number two is in memory. And here's the question. I added a virtual column to my table and asked for it to be put into the in memory store, but nothing happened. And the question was why? And to walk through this uh, problem, we'll do a little demo. So let's go to a new share. 
And what do they call a demo? In mem. So here's our in memory demo uh, addressing the issue of someone said, I have a virtual column, I put it into in memory, and nothing happened. To elaborate nice and easily or be able to demonstrate this, what I've done is I've created a table called T. It's got owner, object type, object ID. I've added a virtual column and it's called object details and naturally it'd be very unlikely for you to ever have a virtual column defined in this way. I've deliberately chosen it as six, is it six? Four. Four nested square root commands on the object ID. The reason I've chosen this is Obviously, if I query the object details for a large amount of data, that's going to be some heavy, hardcore processing. I'm going to be doing lots and lots of square roots, obviously, for as many rows as there are on the table. That makes it very easy to see if this expression has to be evaluated, because it'll be take a long CPU time to do, or whether it can be done uh, with a shortcut using a, an in-memory store. We're going to use that column to decide how things go into and come out of in-memory. So I'm going to insert 20 copies of DBA objects into that table. So you can see I've populated that table with about 1. Point, was it 1.6 million rows of data and committed them away. Let's see what happens with no in memory in play. I'm doing max of that object details virtual column. And you can see because I'm doing 1.6 million times four square root function calls, it's about five seconds. It takes a long time to do. And that may well be the motivation for putting this virtual column or the entire table into the in-memory column store, effectively to pre-compute uh, some of those results. So this is what I've done. I've said alter table T in memory. And as we know that, that it's the first uh, subsequent read of that table that effectively kickstarts in memory into play saying, yep, you've asked for this to be in memory. Someone's actually now accessing the data. So let's go populate the column store. So you can see there, if I look at V dollar IM segments, that in the time I've been chattering away, that we've actually managed to populate it into in memory. I've got it twice there just in case it was um, not finished by the time we actually finished talking here. But it's fully in memory now, so I should be able to now query that table as if it was stored in the in memory column store and get all those wonderful benefits. So I run select max object details again, and the first thing you see is something a little bit disheartening. I'm still at five seconds. And if I look at the execution plan, oh, that's no good. Have I got, obviously my, um, my poor old uh, query cache is too small to hold onto that thing for long. Uh, you'll have to take my word for it that it actually um, said uh, table access full in memory table. It will kill it and we'll go again. How's that? Let's see how that goes. So we'll just go a little bit faster through it. So hopefully things get chucked out of my poor little SGA. So five seconds through, put it into in memory, select count star, it's been populated. I do it again. And as we said, it takes five seconds too long. Ah, still not working. Oh, well, something's wrong with uh, my poor old explain plan there. But as you can see, with five seconds of elapsed time, we know that we're not taking any advantage of the in-memory column store. The reason for that is actually well documented. By default, virtual columns will not be put into the in-memory column store if you just put the table into in-memory. And that's because the in-memory virtual columns parameter is set to manual. You have to explicitly nominate them. So let's do that. Alter table in-memory and let's nominate now that virtual column. I'll rerun a select count star from T to kickstart the in-memory column store into play. And we can see that it's now populated and complete. And this is once again a bit disheartening. I'm back to five seconds still. Now, why is that the case? I spoke to the in-memory manager about this and he said, if the table has been fully populated into in-memory column, into in-memory column store, simply doing a modification to add a virtual column a modification to the in-memory definition isn't enough to actually flush the contents out of the in-memory column store and repopulate it. We're generally going to try and avoid doing that because it's a very expensive operation to do. You need to be a bit more explicit. So let's take it out of in-memory. I'm going to put it into in-memory and now add the virtual column as well. 
and now that I've set up that metadata, now I can run the select count star from T. And that's the kickstarting that comes into place after I've told the database about that virtual column. So you can see this time it's completed. It's compl just double check. Now let's run our select max object details. And as you can see, it's now instantaneous elapsed time near zero. So that's one of those little tricks that might trap you out if you're using in memory. You need to be very careful about the order of operations. Just coming back after the fact and telling a table, oh yeah, I'd like to change the in-memory to do this, to do that, whatever. Well, we're going to be quite hesitant about throwing stuff away from that in-memory column store because obviously it's incredibly value for, valuable for queries. And it's quite expensive to populate the in-memory column store. It's not like the buffer cache where you just drag blocks off disk and stick them in the buffer cache and they pretty much look like they were on disk. We're dragging data off disk and then we're converting rows to columns. We're deduplicating, we're compressing, we're you know, doing co column compression units. There's a lot of heavy going CPU stuff going on. We're not going to do that just sort of on an ad hoc basis. We're going to try and minimize the impact on your server. So let's move on now, not just on virtual columns, but in terms of actually detecting what's actually going on, how to know without actually running queries whether things are in the in-memory column store or not. And it's actually a little bit, um, there's a few idiosyncrasies here. So I'm going to take that table out of in-memory and put it back into in-memory, do a select count star, and then populate the in-memory column store. And it's done. Now at that point in time, you can I did no in-memory and then in-memory, so the virtual column is no longer in the in-memory column store. Can I tell without actually running a query? I can to some degree, and let me describe that better. You can see if I look at I am a column level, that's fairly uh, sort of stands out that it says, yep, the column's owner, object type, and object ID, they're all defined as in memory, but object details is unspecified because I took it out of in memory and just put it back into in memory. I didn't touch the object details column. So that sort of gives us some confidence that yes, it's not in the in-memory column store. However, if I now do alter table in-memory object details, as we saw in the first demo, that's not sufficient to actually force object details into the in-memory column store because it's all nice and freshly populated at the moment. Unfortunately, if I look at IM column level, it's more giving me a impression of the metadata, as in, yes, you've told me that you'd like object details to be in the in-memory column store. But it's not, as we saw before. And this is the key. This uh, VDL view is IMEU header, the in-memory expressions. And expressions are like virtual columns. So what expressions are in the in-memory column store? And at the moment, there are none. That's our clue that tells us that there's actually not the in-memory population completed for that object details column. So I'll kick it out of in-memory put the whole thing back into in-memory and then add in object details as we did before. Give in-memory a kick in the teeth to actually say, yep, go and populate it. And it's been completed. And now if I look at V$ IMEU header, you can see there's actually three rows in there. That's our indication that we've actually populated not just the in-memory column store, but some in-memory expressions as well. And as we saw in the second demo, that actually is our way of seeing that the object details is actually in the in-memory column store. So it's one of those things you need to be careful here because just doing the metadata, telling the database what you would like in and out of the in-memory column store, isn't sufficient activity to actually force things into the in-memory column store because we're going to try avoid those CPU overheads when we run it. Let's look at a non-virtual column example here where we nominate different kinds of in-memory compression for different columns. So I'm going to create a table called T as 20 copies of DBA objects. And now I'm going to nominate all sorts of different levels of compression for the in-memory column store. So owner on object ID, they're going to be for query, object type, object type for DML, object name for query high, etc, etc. So lots and lots of um, pieces of metadata there. And I've also said I don't want duplicated and sharded columns uh, in the in-memory column store at all. So I've done all that. I do a select count star to prime the column store. I go look at IM segments and there's nothing there. 
Maybe that's just the complexity of the metadata means it's taking a long time to do it. So I try again, it's still not there. And this is key. If I go look at, let me scroll back a touch, I am column level, you can see all the metadata is there for query low, for query high, default for query low, etc. All the metadata was preserved, but I haven't actually populated the in memory column store. It's still empty. What I do need to do is follow up with an explicit in memory for at the table level. Just nominating all the individual columns is really just doing a metadata definition. It's only when I come along and afterwards say, yep, I've defined all my metadata. Now let's put the whole thing in memory and then give it a count star to give it a prime. And there we have, it's actually now completed and in the end memory column store. And it's all done. Is that the end of it? Yep. I should note, there's no change in the IAM column level table. There's no flag in that view that tells you, oh, it's just metadata. It's not in the in memory column store or it's metadata and I've pushed it in there. You don't get that, unfortunately, from there. So I really just wanted to show you those because it, it explains why some people uh, are critical of in-memory sometimes because what they think is in the in-memory column store uh, is not and, and perhaps vice versa. So you need to be aware of that, that you need to be uh, careful in terms of the order in which you apply these commands and obviously to go check the v$im etc views to make sure your data is actually in the in-memory column store to make sure you get those amazing benefits of performance in particular uh, because in memory every time i do an in memory demo for people it blows my mind and it generally blows their mind as well in terms of just the astounding performance and uh, improvements you can get and don't get me wrong i know it ain't cheap uh, but yeah you get what you pay for number two r man performance and this came through on an ask tom question I would imagine this is a very common scenario in, in terms of backup strategy. And that is, we do a full backup each week and an incremental each night. And if you use our cloud services, the vast majority of our cloud backup services do exactly this. A full backup at regular intervals with incrementals in between. This person said, I expected the incrementals to be very fast, but they take just as long as the full. And why is this? That's actually a very common question that comes in on Ask Tom, or just even when I'm at conferences, people say, oh, I take up fools every night because the incrementals didn't give me any real benefit anyway. Or there's a consensus out there that the only reason people would use incrementals is because it means you'll use less space, but other than that, you don't get a lot of benefit. That's sort of true, but sort of false, depending on the technology you're using. And to explain why incrementals are almost as slow as a full, it's, we just have to look at how, what the database is doing when it actually performs the backups at various levels. If I'm doing a full or a level zero backup, they're pretty much the same thing. Just They really just determine the eligibility in an incremental backup regime. The database obviously is full of stacks and stacks of data files, which are each full of stacks and stacks of blocks. And so a full backup is relatively straightforward. We read the first block, and write it out to a backup location. Could be tape, could be disk, doesn't really matter. We read the second block, it goes out to a backup location, and so forth. Yeah, it's not rocket science. Uh, there's obviously some smarts in there that Arman does, which means we don't have to do the old alter table space begin backup, end backup that we used to do if you're of a DBA vintage like myself, but Arman knows um, the contents of blocks and knows how it's going to re-architect those blocks if there are fuzzy or in flight during the backup, which is pretty cool just in itself. Once we get onto an incremental backup above the level of a, uh, pre a previous backup, so a level one above a level zero or a level two above level one, etc., then the database is unchanged in size. We still actually have to look at every single block. We have to read that block. If it hasn't been changed since the last backup, then we don't have to write it. We read the next block don't have to write it. Next block, if it's been changed, we might have to write that, etc. But the key thing is here, we still have to read every single file and every single block in the database. And that's generally why incrementals take roughly the same amount of time as a level zero backup. We're still scanning every single block in the database. The question is, can we do better? 
And yes, we can. And it's, this is one of those things that this always I've, it flabbergasts me. And if people, if this is a technology I'm, that I'm about to mention is new to people, I'm not having a go at you. It's one of those things where I think this should be pretty much the default for any database backup regime. And that is the thing being able to track only which blocks have changed in the database. And we've had this technology for a while, it's called block change tracking, it came out in Oracle 10G. Yet it still astounds me that heaps of customers I visit don't use it or are unaware of it. So that's what motivated me in particular to talk about it tonight on this office hour session. So let's do a little demo. Okay, this is going to test out my MS-DOS batch, batching skills, but we'll do our best. So the first thing I'm going to do is to show you how long it takes to take a full backup of the database that we're running on tonight. And you can see there, where I'll highlight it, we're starting an incremental level zero. So this is a level zero backup. And it's a bit hard to know how long this is going to take because we've also got Zoom doing, burning some CPU, doing some recording and writing video files as we go. But when I tested this morning, it was about 35 seconds. So you can see that, I don't know, 25 seconds elapsed time. The reason it's quite short is I spent most of today emptying out this database and making it nice and small so you wouldn't be bored watching backups run. But we can see there that a level zero backup is about 25 seconds for this database. You can see my data files there, sysorgs, users, ask Tom, etc. They're all fairly small. Let's now run a level one backup. So obviously between the time I took the level zero and the level one, I would imagine almost nothing has changed on my database, very little, maybe some dictionary tables. So it's really just going to write a very small backup, but you can see it still ran for a fair while. It was 25 seconds for a level zero backup and 15 seconds for a level one. They were comparable in time. There was a little bit of benefit in avoiding the writing cost, but typically you'd imagine an incremental that writes some blocks out, for example, the day's worth of changes, is going to be of a comparable kind of time frame to a full backup. Obviously the benefits of incremental, even if it runs as long as a full, are still present. You can see the full backup there was about three and a half gigabytes in the first file, and the incremental was only 155 kilobytes, uh, which is obviously very, very nice. So incremental only backing up the change blocks but it's the length and the duration of that time that we're trying to tackle here. So I'll connect to the database using SQL Plus, we're not in RMAN anymore, and this is literally all you need to do. In your container database at the root, you do this at root level, not in the pluggable, you simply do alter database, enable block change tracking, and nominate a file. I simply chose one on my X drive here. That's it, that's all you have to do. The rest is managed automatically by the database. What this is doing is telling the database that I want to actually now track which blocks have been changed in my database. So rather than the incremental backup having to read all the blocks to work out which ones have changed, it can use this mapping file to actually work out what's going on. People are going to ask me, what's the cost? What's the overhead? What's the performance cost? Um, I don't know. I can't give you an exact number, but I've used block change tracking in just about every client database I've ever worked with over the last, I don't know, decade or so since Oracle 10 came out, I've never even noticed a performance overhead. Um, it's very, very efficient. So let's go back to our database. I'm going to do rerun of that same script. So I'm going to work a level zero backup now. It's going to take the same 25 seconds. This is the first backup I'm taking after enabling block change tracking. It doesn't know what blocks have been changed before that I set that flag, so it actually has to reroute all the blocks in the database. So this will take, one would hope, around about 25 seconds. Again, ah, there we go, elapsed time, 25 seconds. So for your full backups, no change. Let's now run the incremental, and it's done. Look at that, elapsed time, one second. Now that's obviously optimal because I ran this straight after the previous backup, so in between that time, virtually nothing has changed. But using that block check, change checking, well, let me try that again. Using that block change tracking file, I have a direct map into which files and which blocks have been modified, and the backup process can utilize that to very quickly identify the change blocks. 
If I run another incremental, you can see it's just as quick again. Incredibly quick. Now let's make it a little bit more realistic. Let's do some changes in our database. So I'm going to log onto the database into one of my pluggables and do create table as select star from DBA objects. That's about 90,000 rows, somewhere in the vicinity of 12 to 13 megabytes of data I've just created in my database. Let's go back and run my next incremental. Once again, it's still breathtakingly quick. One second and it's done. Do another one, once again, incredibly quick, just super fast. Let's do a directory listing. You can see here's my two level zeros, the whole database, three gigabytes in size. Here's the ones that were incrementals, whether they were block change tracking or not, they're all about 155 kilobytes. They're tiny when there's been nothing that's changed. And here's the one I took after I created that table called T, which is a copy of DBA objects. It was still blazingly fast because block change tracking let me identify the change blocks. And there's my 14 megabytes of new data that's been backed up. So block change tracking is astounding. I love it. It's just so easy. It's trivial to turn on. The overheads are negligible. And it's just a fantastic way of making your incrementals blazingly fast. When would you not use block change tracking? Probably the only examples I could think of is you may have one of those databases which uh, undergoes something close to or near a complete refresh every night. Um, I've seen some sort of data marts where each night almost the whole thing is repopulated from scratch. It might be just a whole build of build jobs of the build summaries and, and summaries upon summaries and all that kind of stuff. If you're building a database almost from scratch every night or of huge volumes of the database, well, why would you bother with blockchain tracking? Because you'd be copying almost all the blocks anyway. If that's the case, then maybe just stick with your fools and, and fools every night. But the reality is, I would say for the vast majority of databases, the amount of volume of data that's changed each day, no matter how large that is, is typically a very small percentage of the overall size of the database. So you might get some dramatic improvements just by moving to blockchain tracking. Number four, my hints are not working. Ah, this old chestnut. I'm hinting in SQL to make it perform better, but the hints are being ignored by Oracle. What am I doing wrong? Possibly many things, possibly nothing. Let's explore. I put this in here because in this same question, someone put a quote actually to a blog. They said, I found this on a blog post. In the real world, hints are ignored frequently by the optimizer. And I could put the source of the blog post here, but it's not, you know, I'm not on a witch hunt here. It's sort of a little bit of misinformation out there, which I wish would be fixed by people who own blogs. But also, I'll happily accept that it's perhaps somewhat Oracle's fault in the sense that we sort of chose some bad terminology. It would have been better. I thought I was going to, in the real head, hints are ignored. That's cool. That's absolute BS. This is, would have been a much better choice of terminology. Hints are invalid frequently, and therefore we can't use them, or the optimizer can't use them. And this is probably a, would have been a better choice of um, nomenclature by us inside Oracle, in terms of we sometimes use the term ignored, and, and it sort of creates this perception, especially with the word hint, which doesn't sound like you know, an order. It creates this perception that the database sort of, you know, you lob at some things that sort of looks at it and says, oh, you know, I'd rather not. Or, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. It doesn't work that way. A hint that cannot be followed by the optimizer is the ones that we, we choose to ignore. Uh, they're generally invalid. So let's look at some examples. So here's, a, here's a, little, a little quiz for people. If you quickly just cast your eye down those four statements and try and work out which of the statements actually has a valid hint. So the first one is I want to use the accounts primary key index. The second one is I want to use an index on the accounts table. Third one, I want to use an index on scott.accounts. And the last one is use index on A. And there's a very simple answer to which one of those queries has a valid hint. And the answer is none of them. They're all invalid. And that's perhaps one of those nasty things about hints is because they are presented to the optimizer in the form of a special comment, if the hint is incorrectly uh, constructed, it just becomes a comment. 
there's nothing in the database that tells you, oh yes, there's, there's no flag that you can say, if that hint is wrong, then error out the SQL. In 19C, which I didn't put some slides for, we've moved some distance toward addressing this. Part of the execution plan can now show you which hints were not used um, and why they were not used. It's um, the new parameter in the format option called hint underscore report. So when 19 comes along, uh, that'll be something that obviously all SQL tuners will be relishing. There are other ones, for example, sometimes a hint is correctly constructed, but it is impossible for us to use. For example, the top one there, I'm saying I want to use a hash join between employee and department. We can only use hash joins because of the way hashing works. Hashing is an algorithm that takes values, puts them into a hash algorithm, and then looks at things that match. So hashing only can work on equality based joins. Now, if I'm doing D salary between, well, that should be E salary, that's a typo in itself. If I'm doing E salary between department low and department high, that's an, inequ that's an inequality join. It's a range based join. It, we can never use a hash join for that particular join. So the hint is, use that term again, ignored. It's actually invalid. That hint makes no sense. It's impossible to follow. For example, this one, the second one. I want to do an index hint and use parallel. An index hint by, the, by itself is an index range scan hint, not an index fast full scan. We can't do range scans in parallel. So the combination of those two hints makes the whole thing invalid. So these are some of the common things that mean a hint is simply, we can simply not respect that. The optimizer says, look, I'd love to help you, but I can't. The final question is, well, what if they are valid? What if the hint are valid? You know, what happens there? And this is the classic sort of infamous one. People say, oh, the optimizer ignored my hint, even though it was correct. So let's look at a demo of that. Hopefully that comes up. So here's my simple query. It's the age old time of scott.emp and scott.department tables. Simple join, doing a select star, and I get a merge join. You can see I'm doing a merge join here across the database. I might say, yep, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not happy with merge joins. You know, for some reason my sorting, you know, table space is terrible, I have problems with sorting, whatever the reason might be. I'm, you know, I've read that hash joins are super cool. I want a hash join. So I type in use hash, and what do I get? A merge join again. This is the classic one where people put out on blogs or on Twitter or any kind of social media. Oh, the optimizer, it ignored me. You know, they just, they're shattered. You know, they ignored my hint. Well, it didn't. Let's explore a bit more carefully what that hint actually is. So if I take that SQL and just pull it apart a bit, and insert a few things in there. If I highlight the use hash, what is use hash? If you go look at the documentation, it says use hash followed by the table alias says, if you're joining into that table, you have to use a hash join. That's, you know, and that's what the hint says. If I'm joining into D, I must use a hash join. And which might think, well, why was I using a merge join then? Well, let's look at the execution plan. This is the execution plan we saw before, but I've just spaced it out a bit. I'm starting with department table. I'm not joining into the department table. I'm joining into the employee table, leading off with department, finishing with employee. My hint said, if I'm starting with department, sorry, if I'm starting, oh, let's go from the top. My hint said, if I'm joining into department, make sure you use a hash join. But I'm not. I'm not going into department. I'm just going into the employee table. The only way I can go into the department table is if I start with the employee table. So let's give the optimizer that information. Now I'm saying, look, you must start with the employee table. And then if you choose to go into the department table, it must be a hash join. And lo and behold, we have a hash join. So while we're sitting there saying, oh, the optimizer is going to ignore our hints, that's actually not true. What's happening is we simply gave the optimizer a particular path it must choose 
under a particular set of circumstances. But there were many other circumstances that were left available to the optimizer. And that's why generally, if you see an optimizer ignoring your hints, it simply means that your hint was actually not completely specified. Hi, from Hello. Oh, I had someone on the line. If you have a question, throw it in the chat line, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll continue. Let's take that simple example and make it uh, a little bit more complicated now. And this was an example that uh, once we get to more real world queries, someone's added the audit hint, which is a very popular hint. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a fan of the audit hint and the leading hint in the sense that often when we write SQL, we're writing it along the lines of how we expect the database to process it. Someone writing this SQL sort of might be thinking, okay, I want to start with the employees. Once I've got my employees, then I'm going to head to the jobs table. And then I need to find out some stuff about the average salary. So here's my inline view, which gives me all the average salaries for a particular location. And then hopefully I'll sort of work my way through it. So it's quite common to see the ordered or leading hints in queries because you're helping the optimizer understand where your thought process was coming from. I run this, I run the audit hint. When I look at the execution plan, well, it obviously didn't respect it. I said start with employees and then go to jobs, but we can see here it actually started with departments and then went to employees and actually finished with jobs. So you might be thinking, well, it ignored my hint again. This one is perhaps a little bit more up for debate. One of the things that happens to all queries before they actually get optimized is we do with what's called query transformation. If I actually run a 10053 trace on that query, and that's beyond the scope of tonight's talk because I'm conscious of the time, this is actually what the query looks like before the optimizer finally got its hands on it and trying to optimize it. You can, if you look at a 10053 trace, the final query after transformations, notice there's no inline view anymore. And this is sort of a general consensus. The, the database will try to take nested inline views and subqueries and sort of turn the whole thing into one big giant join. And then it tries to optimize that. That's a very loose definition of how the optimizer quant transformations work, but bear with me. But you can see this, is, this query here is actually what we then went ahead and optimized. Because we actually took out the inline view and we've reshuffled the tables around, we pretty much have to throw away that ordered hint because there's no guarantee that this reshuffling actually will have the tables in the same order in the actual query syntax that you provided to it with your ordered hint originally. If we've reshuffled the tables around and then still obeyed your ordered hint, well, who, you know, we're actually getting a, a totally incorrect result as per your wishes. So you just be need to wear that query transformation may make your hints no longer relevant to the optimizer or we actually throw them away for the benefit of the query because otherwise we would be respecting wishes that were not originally yours. The only way you can maybe preserve that is I can tell the database, look, I'd rather you didn't merge those queries into one big ginormous query. So this is one way of preserving your ordered hint. I've added this no merge hint, which says take this view called V and I'm not allowing you to merge it back into the higher level query. Treat it on its own merits. Because I haven't merged it, the query will now be presented like this to the optimizer. And because none of the tables have been reshuffled around, the audit hint can be preserved. If I look at the execution plan, we can see what we did. We went employees, then we went jobs as per the audit hint, and then we went into the view because it was never re-merged out. So if you're seeing leading hints and audit hints disappearing or not being obeyed by the optimizer, the most probable cause is query transformation. You can see that in a 10053 trace, or you might want to do some no merging to make sure that your query uh, sort of goes to the optimizer um, untouched by its um, transformation process. On a similar perspective, one of the things I'm a huge fan of is query block naming, the QB name hint, which we spoke about in another office hours a while ago. So I've got a query block Q1 here for this outer select and QB name Q2 for this inner select. 
because this is the same query as before and i put no hints in besides the query block names this is going to go undergo through this is going to undergo query transformation so when i go look at the execution plan and ask for the aliases the query block names as well you can see that well they're sort of still floating around but the actual entire query has got a brand new query block name, something that we never gave it. That's because that query that we presented to the database was totally transformed and effectively query blocked anew. This is one of the sort of shortfalls of query block naming is that the query block names you see here and even here, they might preserve your query block names, but they might actually no longer refer to the queries that you were originally responding to. This is the table called D that was in query block number two. Now it's in this query block. So this is like source and target. So query block names can literally disappear after query transformation. Just something to be aware of. Let me look at one more example here. I um, can't remember what this one is. So I've got a table called T. It's, got, it's a copy of DBA objects just for a number of select columns. I might say, look, I want to do a full scan on this and what does it do index fast full scan now how on earth did that happen i've said look i want you to do a full table scan on this table called t2 it's only 80,000 rows i'm not doing any where clauses surely you should do a full table scan yet it did an index fast full scan why is that well behind the scenes i didn't reveal this to you t2 is actually an indexed organized table so once again this is a last example of where a hint that seems to be totally valid might have to be ignored by the optimizer. There is no such thing as a table access full on an index organized table because there is no table. It's only an index. So once again, look at things like the structure of your objects if you're getting queries that seem to be ignoring optimizer hints. Uh, there's always going to be a good reason for it. So that's why the optimizer ignores hints. Hopefully that uh, provides some clarity. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, hints are like violence. If one hint's not working, try add some more hints as well. And that generally can get you over the edge. As we saw before, use hash didn't work, but adding the leading hint made it work as well. And obviously, if you take that to its nth degree, if I keep adding hints to make to lock something in to make sure it's actually working exactly as I like, well, by the time I get three hints or four hints or 10 hints, well, maybe I should just be using a baseline. I would be using SQL plan management to have those hints locked in for all eternity to keep those plans nice and stable. That's a topic for another office hours, obviously. Number five, small tables. We, oh, we got, what we got, small tables? Yeah, we might get through this. I read that small tables do not need indexes. How small is small? At what point do we no longer index a small table? Now, this is a little embarrassing. And let me explain why it's embarrassing. Because when this question came in, I said, that is total BS. There is no way that anyone should ever advise you that a small table should not need the index. I said, where did you read that? That is absolute garbage. And they went, oh, it's in the Oracle Administrator's Manual. And yes, it is. That's from the 18C. Um, I haven't checked the 19C docs, but yet there it is. Smack right in hard copy print. Small tables do not require indexes. Yeah, not so good. So let's talk about where that argument comes from. And it comes in this concept what I call plausibility. Um, and plausibility is a risky thing. And let me give you an example which is unrelated to Oracle, but hopefully explains why plausibility is generally not such a great idea. I've got a chessboard here and I've got some dominoes. In fact, I've got one domino. The obvious question is, or my little puzzle is, can I cover completely a chessboard with dominoes? Well, I can't. It's fairly obvious. Each domino occupies two, two, um, two squares. I just throw them in however I want and you can see I can cover it up. The interesting trivia question is, is if I remove two of the squares on the chessboard, so you can see the two little boxes of blue there, like I've cut them out with a saw, can I still cover a chessboard with two square sized domino pieces? And yes, I can. That's how I solved that one. What if I move the squares around a bit? How about those two? Not a drama. How about that one? Not a drama. 
This is the plausibility concept. I can take as many different sets of you know, missing two pieces as I want, and I just keep filling in with dominoes. Therefore, a plausible claim of mine would be, yep, as long as you take away an even number of squares, I can always fill it with dominoes. Well, let's look at this final example. What if I take away the two corners? Can I fill it with dominoes? And you're welcome to try this. And the answer is, you can't. It's impossible. And this is trivial to prove. Every time I cover a square, uh, the chessboard with a single domino, I must cover a black and a white space. So every domino will always cover a black and a white. In that example, I took away two whites. So now I've got more blacks than I have whites on that board. It is impossible to cover with dominoes. And in fact, any combination where you take away two of the same color can never ever be covered with, an, with dominoes. So just because I presented a number of arguments that said, yep, it seems to be possible, plausibility is not proof. And here's the, here's the plausibility argument that people make with small tables. Here's my small table. I'm looking for one row in it, and that table looks like it's got three blocks. So I do one read, two read, three reads, because even when I found my row, I still continue to see if there's more of the same matching my predicate. That's only three IOs, but of course, full table scans are better than that. I can do that all with one IO, because I have a thing called multi-block read count. It could be one, it could be two, eight, up to 128 blocks I could read all at once. So you even see people arguing that if my table's less than 128 blocks, I don't need to index it because I can do that in one I.O. One I.O. is all I need. Compare that to an index. If I put an index on that small table, well, an index is a B tree. I have to read the root block, then I have to read the branch or the leaf blocks, and only then can I go get the data pointed to by that index. So there's my claim. It seems to make sense. One I.O. for the full table scan, minimum, absolute minimum three IOs for the index read. Surely I shouldn't have an index. The problem is plausibility is not the same as proof. Let's actually go look at an example. Put that. So here's my table called small employees. It's just a copy of scott.emp, but I've added some more rows to it, simply multiple copies of the scott.emp table. So we can see it's got 182 rows. So I'd argue that's, you know, you can, that's a reasonably small table. It's so small, it occupies one block. You can see it's 182 rows. It sits entirely within one block or single 8K block. It's even a smaller table than the example in these slides there, which had three blocks. This is a one block table. Surely it is no faster way of reading that table than simply reading that one block. So what's the execution plan? Just to prove I haven't got any indexes on at the moment, I do a select star from small employee where the employee number is 8104, just grab one of them at random that I know is there. It's gonna do table access full. Let's do a performance test on that now. So to see how many reads I'm going to do, I'm going to take a snapshot of my session logical reads in my session as it stands now. Now I'm going to do 200,000 queries with that one row. So I'm doing 200,000 one row lookups, simulating lots of applications busily attacking this one table. And then I look at my session logical reads after it and take away what it was before. And you can see it at 400,000 logical IOs how long did my 200,000 reads take? 3.76 seconds. So remember that 400,000 IOs, 3.7 seconds. Let's now add an index. So now when I do a query on this table, 8104, that's the primary key, I'm gonna do an index lookup. Once again, it's only a one block table. This must be doing more IOs because I need to read the index and then the table. Grab my session logical reads before I start the benchmark, run my benchmark, exactly the same, 200,000. And look, it's nearly twice as fast. So performance wise, it's better than no indexes there. How many logical IOs? The same amount. So even this simple example shows that for the same amount of logical IO, I can get the job done with an index twice as fast. And twice as fast actually means 
half as much CPU because obviously these are all in buffers. It's a one row table, it's not gonna be on disk. So having that index, even for a one block table for index access lookup is going to be better. But I can go better than that because when I have small tables, I can do, you know, I can take advantage of certain exploits, like for example, making them indexed organized tables or adding indexes for columns that are commonly queried together. So I'm going to repeat the demo now with a new index, which has the employee number plus the columns I was querying. I'm effectively making a thin version of the table in an index structure. As you can see now, when I do this query, the whole thing can be satisfied from the index. I don't even have to visit the table. Check the logical reads before I start, run my benchmark. It's about the same speed, 2.3 seconds as the index lookup. Now I'm doing half the logical IO. It was 400,000, now it's only 200,000. Anything that reduces logical IO lowers CPU, but also improves concurrency because logical IO generally has to be latched and latching hurts concurrency. So the less logical IO you do, the better your application scale. What if I'm doing range scans? Here's my unindexed table because I haven't got an index on the higher date table. Run that. Uh, that's, that's a lie, unfortunately, because I highlighted it and therefore paused it. That's a bummer. Um, takes about four and a half seconds. I don't want to, I don't want to bad mouth the uh, non-index version. Put an index on higher date, run it again, 3.4 seconds. A little bit faster because it's a range scan, not a full table scan. Run it again. I put the extra columns now in the index and I'm down to three seconds. Benefits are there for the smallest of small tables. Even if it only has one block, indexes will help small tables. Small tables not requiring indexes is terrible advice. Now we've got one more topic to do. It's just coming up to nine o'clock. This one won't take long, so bear with me. I know Easter's coming. I know Easter's here, but bear with me. We've only got five more minutes to go. Faster inserts. This is the problem that came in. This is quite an interesting one. We provide data to an external third party provider and they load it into their database. They won't accept data pump, etc. They only accept DML scripts. And this is not uncommon. Sometimes providers take um, data for multiple different database platforms, whether it's SQL Server, Oracle, etc. So they don't want proprietary you know, file formats from each of these vendors. They just want to be able to run SQL scripts. They obviously take forever to run. How do I speed them up? One of these super cool things with SQL Developer and SQL CL is you can use this special hint. Just you put it in a comment of insert, and when you query a table, you get it back as inserts. That's really awesome. But of course, by definition, if you're inserting with a values clause, it is row by row at a time. And uh, my predecessor, Tom Kite, used to have that cliche row by row equals slow by slow. So what are the fixes? Here's, when I'm ever doing this and I see something taking way too long because it is just a stream of insert commands. The quick fix number one is every single one of those inserts, because it is full of literals you can see there in the values clause, is individually parsed. That adds a CPU and elapsed time overhead. So the first fix I do when I'm doing any kind of inserts like this, the quick fix is just do cursor sharing equals force at the start and reset it back to exact at the end. That turns every single one of those inserts into a shared SQL because they're now all replaced with bind values. That's like a simple, quick and dirty fix you can do to your script, throw it at the start and the end, and generally things run a huge amount better. So that's quick fix number one. Quick fix number two uh, requires a demo. It's our last demo for the night. So here's my table called source data. It's a copy of DBA objects. It's about 80,000 rows. There's uh, 82,000 in particular. So if I was doing this in SQL CL or SQL develop or any other tool where I said unload it to inserts, obviously, I pre-populated this, it would give me 82,000 insert statements, each with all the literals. As I said, I can put cursor sharing on there to make an improvement, but I still have to process 82,000 insert statements. What if I could process 
less insert statements for the same number of rows? Well, I can. Back in Oracle 9, we introduced a thing called multi-table insert. And what that lets you do is, depending on certain conditions, load the same source data into multiple different tables. That was the target. But I can utilize this for the same purpose. I can say insert all, but the target is the same for all of them. Nominate the literal values. Normally you would nominate things that came from the incoming select, but I'm just doing select from dual. So now a single insert statement in this can actually load five rows with one trip to the database. That gives me a multiplying effect. I only need one fifth the number of insert statements now. Now the problem is, how do I write such a set of insert statements? Because none of the tools provide it. Well, I thought I'd write one. So this is a little procedure here that I just does some DBMS SQL and tries to manufacture those insert statements for you. I've called the function as insert. So all I have to do is call my as insert function and then pass in a query that I want. I've said I want them to come out in batches of five and it produces, it actually throws in the cursor sharing force for us and says, yep, there's the first five rows, there's the second five rows and so forth. So let's give it a performance test. As I said, I've already spooled out 82,000 inserts for that source data into a table. I'm gonna load that into target one and then I'm gonna load target two with the same thing, but I'm using the multi-table insert to try and make it faster. So here's the conventional population script. It started at 9.04, 12 p.m. my time. And we'll see how long it takes to load 82,000 individual insert statements. It's chugging away. So this is what you get by default out of pretty much any tool that generates insert statements. Oh, come on, I know I'm running over time. Come on, come on, come on. I thought it was about 30 seconds when I tested it today, but maybe it's a bit longer. It's doing its best, it's doing its best. There we go. So we're from 90412 to 90, so 90412 to 9052, what's that 50 seconds it took? And then I ran the multi-table insert, 502 to 505. 50 seconds down to three seconds. There we go, multi-table insert for the win. Um, I'll put that function out on my blog, so anyone needing to generate um, inserts in multi-table style, I quite like this one. And we're done. I'm only around five minutes over, that's not so bad. Uh, just to, once again to say happy Easter if you Please have a safe holiday if you celebrate it, um, even if you don't have a safe next few days. And um, once again, that's how you get in touch with me. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope you thoroughly enjoyed this Office Hours. It'll be available on YouTube in due course. But for now, uh, thanks everyone and have a wonderful holiday season. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.